ready to swoop on it. And they only need one. Charlie Spargo says, I'll do it for you. And he does. Got Spargo out wide and he's loose. He steps and he goes. Hello, welcome to another episode of Inside Melbourne. Clint Stanaway with you. Caddy Price alongside me. Hey, Caddy. Hi, Clint. Great to be here. A really special episode. Um, for the supporters today because we've got two special guests, in fact. Um, All this coming off uh, another good win for the Demons, sixth place on the ladder, percentage building win over the Dogs, but a huge challenge this weekend against the Cats. Yeah, it certainly will be, as you said, coming off a great win, brilliant third quarter effort against the Dogs, um, which was great to see, but really looking forward to getting stuck into today's questions with our guests and one absolute legend of our industry. Let's get to him right now. I speak of Mike Sheen, a guy who was Chief Football Writer at the Herald son for some 18 years these days you can hear him on sen and see him on fox footy mike hello to you hi clint hi katie hey it's great to have you here it's uh, nice to be here this is a, we had sort of two or three aborted attempts we but did it's, uh, finally nice to <laughs> be here with you uh tell us about the melbourne football club and your association uh with the club uh, you kept it secret for many years that you supported the demons yeah well i was in uh a, a practice a practitioner in the media for 40 odd years and my own view is that you shouldn't actually flaunt your club allegiance. I mean if someone says who do you barrack for, I happily said Melbourne, uh, but I don't think you should actually wear your scarf and yeah. be seen to be jumping up and down. Uh, and when you do the media as long as I did, you tend to become neutralised mm-hmm. and I did even though there were times that you know, clearly you'd be excited about something that happened at Melbourne or disappointed when it went the other way. But it's nice now that um, I'm out of newspapers, which I have been since 2011, that I can actually go to the footy, wear my scarf and uh, wear my heart on my sleeve. Well, what does a day at the footy now look like for Mike Sheehan? Where do you sit? <laughs> well, How do you enjoy it? Katie, the, tr- the truthful answer is that I don't go as often as, um, as I might. Um, I tend to go if I've been invited to a function. Uh, and probably don't sit out the front as much as I should because I actually do genuinely enjoy that. Like everyone who loves their footy loves sitting out the front. But um, it's so comfortable watching it on telly uh, that I've sort of succumbed (laughs) to that temptation to sort of know that just turn it on five minutes before the game starts and watch it. And if they're going not quite as well as I'd like... You can turn it off. (laughs) I don't know if I do that too often, but you can get angry at home. And it's just so I think I genuinely think it's a problem for the AFL. Do you yell and scream at the TV? Are you one of those supporters? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I like watching the footy by myself Mm. because then no one can rebuke (laughs) me about my language (laughs) or or, or my negativity. You know, every true supporter of a football club takes a negative view, I reckon. Oh, the league's not enough. Oh, they've kicked two in a row. We're gone. All that sort of stuff. So you can indulge yourself when you're at home by yourself. You, you were just about to say that it's a problem for the AFL. Well, well, well I think that, that it's so comfortable yeah. watching TV at home. From your armchair, that yeah. You, you really do need a, a reason to, sort of, to go. I mean, it's better there. Mm. I agree with that. Better there when, you, when you're watching the whole... And you can see the whole, the whole thing unfold in front of you. But it is very comfortable, particularly in winter in the depths of winter, sitting at home and watching with perhaps a glass of red and a pizza and uh, and the red legs on TV. <laughs> How good. What an afternoon. Uh, before we get stuck into some questions from the outer and also just um, track back um, about your association with Melbourne, um, I want to ask you about the game just last weekend. It was it was a win Melbourne had to have against the yeah. Doggies. But, but it was a win that we should have expected Absolutely. To. So I, I didn't uh, get too excited about what happened at the weekend. I mean, I, I must say at half time, I was a bit concerned. Just a little bit nervous, yeah. Yeah, but the Bulldogs' second halves have been terrible. Mm. Are you impressed with that? It's very nice. I'm still watching it closely. Very so, nice. So I, I thought Melbourne would be stung at half time with the way they'd played mm. and also that the Bulldogs have a history of recent weeks of just sort of falling apart in the second half. But I love, I mean, I'm a huge Maxi Gorn fan, like everyone else yep. is in the. Uh, in the Fraternity Melbourne camp yeah. and, uh, and just watching him in the third quarter and watching Gus Brayshaw and those around them. Uh, so it was good. It was, uh, it was a win that we should have had by a margin that we got. It was an extraordinary 13 minutes, that 13 yeah. minutes, that Max, Angus, um, they, they just turned it on. They did. It, yep. was, it was great to watch, Kate. Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually quite optimistic about this week's trip to Geelong. I heard Jordan Lewis on 360 last night talk about it. And he wasn't sort of saying it'll be a challenge and all those cliches. It gave me the impression that deep down, he thinks that we can win this. 
Uh, Mike, you mentioned Max Gorn in that third quarter. He's now second favourite for the Brownlow. If you were doing Mike Shin's top 50, yes. where would he be right now? <laughs> right now, Katie, if, mm. if I were doing them now, um, he would definitely be my first choice ruckman uh, and he would be in my, I'd say five, but maybe three. Top, Certainly top five, maybe top three. Who would be one and two? Um, well, the bloke I like, you know, we have preferences and who we like. I mean, mm. I mean, I love Christian Petraka, but mm. he's not going to be in that mm. context there at the moment because he hasn't been consistent enough. Another bloke I really like playing for is Dane Beams, mm. and uh, his last six or seven weeks been really been influential. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Martin, Dusty Martin hasn't been as good this mm. year, but then I've, as someone made the point the other day, how can you be as good as you were? Like, you can't do that every year because it's just impossible. Um, so, I suppose. I'm happy with Maxi as the best ruckman and probably in the first three or five. Speaking of Maxi, just one more on him, and it's it's a comparative question. Um, comparative because there is a question from the outer comparing him to, to Jimmy Steins. Uh, in terms of the influence, in terms of the um, him as an actual ruckman, um, are they comparable, do you think, Mike? Yeah, they are. They're, yeah, I mean, Mac, uh, Max is... Stamina is really impressive, I reckon, mm. for a big guy. Like, he can get round the ground and continue to do that, and he's a great mark. Mm. Um, I reckon Jimmy was a more reliable kick than Max, mm -hmm. even though Jimmy's was manu a manufactured style. But he sort of, I, th I reckon his level of efficiency with the ball in his hand, particularly closer to those sticks, yes. was probably better than what Max has done. Especially last two weeks, well, yeah, two but, weeks ago. But I think, I think Max is a better technician in the ruck work than Jimmy was. But it's, that's the difficulty of comparing great players, mm. isn't it? I mean, we shouldn't... It's, it's almost denigrating one to say that the I other agree. is better. I agree. They're both doing... They both did great things, and, and Maxie's doing great things for the footy club. Um, your favourite player right now, running around in the red and blue, other than... Going into the M. year, Gorn. it was definitely um, Christian Petrak. And I'll tell you a story, a little story about yeah, uh, track. I was with my daughter, Kate, leaving um, the car park, Olympic Park car park. And Kate said, that's Christian Petraka there. He went behind the car. And I said, is it? And she said, yes, it is. So I said, wind down the window. And I called, I, just, I don't know, spontaneously just called it, hey, mate, come here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know this kid. I'm ordering to come over to the car. <laughs> and he got there. I, I apologised straight away. I just sort of said to him that he was my favourite player mm. in terms of what he could do. Mm. And he hasn't been as good this year as I think he mm. or we would like, but... When he's on, I love watching him play. You didn't ask for an autograph, surely, Mike. I nearly did. I, I was, uh, when Just I heard the snap. words coming out of my mouth, I was just saying, am I Selfie? actually speaking to this kid? <laughs> I'm 50 years older than him. Oh, I love it, Mike. But, but my all-time favourite Melbourne player, uh, and I'm not too different here to most people, is number, the bloke who used to wear number two and played on the wing. Yeah. The great Robbie Flower, yeah. of course. Uh, some special memories there. In terms of a, a favourite uh, Melbourne football club memory, um, you've seen plenty of matches yeah, involving yeah. the red and blue. My favourite memory clearly was the last home and away round of 1987. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are at the Witten Oval, Witten Oval yeah. or Western Oval as it was at the time. That was the day that every position in the, the then five changed mm. with the results in the last round. And we, we were gone, I reckon, yeah. that day. Uh, Greg Eppleston was playing on Tulip at uh -huh. Robbie Flower. And he had no in our bloke had no influence on the game until half time. Uh, and then Gary Lyon broke his leg that day. Yeah, I remember. Uh, and in the last quarter, I think uh, Bobby Flower went to full forward and kicked three from memory, and we won. Yep. And uh, and made it. Into and the there fight. was a there was a sort of the last five minutes of that match involved people crouching around radios. I was and one of the yeah, yeah. You know when people sort of say, oh, I was at the centenary test yeah. and I was here and I yeah. was there. I was actually there that day with a tranny yeah. and everyone was you know, crowding around anyone who had a transistor radio to hear what was happening at Geelong. That was when Hawthorne played Geelong yeah. and that was relevant to what happened to us. And when they hit the front, there was an enormous cheer. When they hit the front, at, uh, 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 when the Hawks hit the front, the cheer was so loud that the players stopped at the, at the Western Oval. They thought that the siren mm. had gone. Wow. And it was just a really uh, like an emotional day for so many teams, uh, including Melbourne. We're going to get to some questions from the outer, um, Katie. Uh, I really um, – there's a few great ones here, Mike. We've been asking uh, the Melbourne fans uh, for just a little bit 
I guess, an open mic session with Mike Sheen himself. <laughs> I'm supposed to Turning ask the, the tables. <laughs> well, we will, we will give Mike Sheen the chance to do exactly that with uh, our second guest, Charlie Spargo, who is uh, standing by and will be joining us very, very shortly. One of your famous interviews on open mic was the one with Mark Jacko yeah. Jackson. That was interesting, not wasn't it? There's a person in the English speaking world that didn't <laughs> apparently see that. <laughs> it was brilliant to watch. Mike, it was, was great it? TV. It was, it was very good from TV. From the outset, too. He just unloaded. Oh. Well, when he said that he hoped I got cancer. Oh, it was well, that's not great, <laughs> clearly. <It's> horrible. <laughs> I think that's how it started. And the funny thing was, I, he almost duped me that day because even though we didn't have good history, yeah. Fox were really keen to get him, uh, me less so. But anyway, it came to pass that he was on. And in the green room beforehand, it was quite, um, you know, we, we were okay with each other. Without, we clearly weren't best buddies, but the chat was okay. And I thought, well, this is going to go okay. Mm. But as soon as the light went on, as soon as we were on camera, then he just decided that to um, to rip into me. And and I, I, there were several times when I thought, do I stop this? Do I walk out? Um, do I uh, chastise him? What do I do? And I thought in the finish, and I think it was the right call. I just said, well, I'll just keep doing my job and people can make their own minds up about how he performed. So the question from MRLM underscore RE is, <laughs> have you heard from him since? If so, how did it go? I haven't spoken to him since and I have no wish to. Yeah, either. fair enough. How did it, how did it end, Mike? Because the interview that we saw ended with the, the fist bump. Um, did we do that, did we? Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was a bit disoriented. Uh, mm. That it was. I mean, it's so really it unsettling mm. when you know that however many thousands mm. are watching, that they're seeing this, and it was clearly him hoeing into me. Mm. Um, the only thing I remember at the finish was when the lights went off, I sort of said, so how do you think you went? In a fairly mm. aggressive tone. And he says, oh, and he wasn't particularly proud, I don't think, mm. of what he'd done. Um, and he said to me, how did you think? And I said, oh, I would have given you a two out of ten. Mm. Um, and there was this brief exchange and then he left and I left and that was the end of it. And, but I did say to the people at Fox, I think their, their inclination immediately after the show was to not run it. Mm. And I said, no, we, we, we have run to it. run it. Mm. We, we, we invited him to come on mm. and we can't just put the ones on who sort of say, I love the show That's and you're it, a really yeah. good guy. Mm. So we had to run it. And I said, the only condition that I'd like to put on is that we run it in its entirety mm. and then people can make their own mind up. Good stuff. Uh, look, let's whiz through a few of these. Uh, Kate, um, of course, has a, a history in footy as well. Kate, uh, your Sheen. Kate, Kate yeah. Sheen, played for the Magpies in an AFLW. She did. Uh, before the unfortunate knee injury. Um, there's a question here from Weasel99. Seeing as your daughter Kate no longer plays for Collingwood, in fact, she's uh, in a role at Richmond, isn't she? Yep. Have you burned all the Magpie merch? I didn't allow it into the house, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Great uh, answer. No, <laughs> there's a photo on my wall, actually, of, of uh, Kate with uh, my three grandchildren all in Collingwood gear. Ooh. But it's part of a montage. Mm. So short of sort of putting some um, paper over the top of that picture, it's just got to stay there. But now, look, I was just really pleased that she got a chance to play at, at the level. And, and she did, even though it ended in disaster. Yeah. She, it was her first touch in, in the game at uh, the Witten Oval and she did her ACL. Mm. But she's working at Richmond now as head of footy ops for the women. And, and loving it. So, you know, uh, mission accomplished because my my desire for her to play football was so that it was a sort of almost like the bridge to getting involved in mm -hmm. administration. Yeah. That's what she's mm -hmm. done. Oh, on the family, Jono asks, are you the only member of your family that supports Melbourne? No, no, no. My, my parents did and um, uh, two of my three brothers did. Well, one still does and the other has passed. But And, and the... the my two brothers who were Melbourne supporters were very keen, like very, very, very keen. Uh, in terms of the, your history, I mentioned your association with the Herald Sun as, as chief football writer, but there was a, a stint at the AFL as well there as media manager. How was the I dark side? I jumped and, uh, and worked, <laughs> worked as the uh, uh, media com communications manager, I think mm. it was called at the time, when Ross Oakley was the CEO. Mm. And I really enjoyed it. I, I, I'd come from the, the old Herald. You remember the, yeah, um, I the do, broadsheet yeah, yeah. Herald? Um, which is a very taxing role, that, because the, you know, the paper would come out during the day. So from the moment you woke in the morning until the moment you went home, like the, the news cycle was just imperative. I mean, mm. just you, no matter what time a story happened, 
you were still alive until mm. probably three in the afternoon. I enjoyed the Herald. I think probably that was almost the best period of my professional life. But it was so taxing that at one point I saw Jack Hamilton, the then AFL CEO in the street. He used to go for a lunchtime walk. Uh, and I got on really well with Jack and we cr crossed paths one day. And I said, Jack, uh, have you got a job for me? And he, go, he said, yeah, but what do you want to do? And I said, well, <laughs> well I, was, I want to do something involved with the media. Mm. Uh, and he said, so come and have a chat to me. And I did. And I went there for four years. Mm. So Ross Oakley replaced um, Jack. And that was the period when West Coast and, and Brisbane came into the mm. competition. It was a momentous period in, the, in, uh, in, in football history. And I was party to that. I used to sit in on the commission meetings um, and write all their statements. And, and I think, without getting ahead of myself, I think they used to use me uh, uh, for counsel at mm. different times about different things. So, and that may, of course, it's going to give you a greater awareness of what happens in football, but it was very important in my development. Mm -hmm. Talking of momentous periods in, in football history, in terms of the Melbourne Footy Club, I know you've gone on the record and said uh, Moore and Templeton's move to the club was one of the biggest, if not the biggest story that you've covered. Is that still the case? Yes. I, I, there are other, there are stories, I mean, there's never just, we, we're all in the same field, so you know mm. what I'm talking about. When There's never just one. I mean, hopefully and realistically, there are sort of a dozen or, or so that we're really fond of because of the impact that they've had and how difficult they were to get up. But when we're talking now, I mean, you imagine the situation with two captains and mm. two Brownlow medalists being pack packaged up in a deal for then That's $1 million. Dollars. That was in 1982. So it was... Uh, this. The funny thing about this is, and I, every time I say it, I sort of... Even I wonder about this. I sat on that story for probably 10 days because I thought, this is just too big to be real. Mm. And, and then it we, was. And then we ran with it on the front page of the uh, the Herald, right across the front page, uh, and then you live in fear, you know, that something will go <laughs> wrong and it won't happen, or <laughs> someone will say, I was only joking, it's April the 1st. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, it happened, it did. Uh, you've taken on many coaches in your time. You've gone head-to-head -head with, with quite a few. Who would be the toughest? Well, <laughs> You know the answer. I know the answer, you? yeah, I do. Well, he's a bloke who used to coach the Bulldogs uh, when we got on well. That's Mickey Malthouse and I. Went to the West Coast when the relationship became strained and then he went to Collingwood and it became further strained. <laughs> and then I think I was out of it when he was at Carlton. But um, Mick is clearly a great coach. You mm. can't coach that many games and have that much success without being good. But my query with Mick is that he just doesn't seem to move on. If you mm. cross Mick, you cross mm. him for life. I think he might have mellowed it a tad. Uh, now, Mick, uh, Mike, uh, sorry. You can call me I was Mick. Like Mick. Clint? Mick Malthouse. <laughs> At least got, you know where I, I work I've got days. Mick Malthouse uh, on my mind still. Well, don't do that. Um, <laughs> it's there not is, a good place to be. No, Clint. exactly. <laughs> there is a question we ask all of our guests here on Inside Melbourne. Um, it is with thanks to our great friends at Zurich, the sponsors of this podcast. Um, what do you truly love, Mike Sheen? Who or what? Is it, it, is it a be, what or it, a who? It, it's a what, a who. Um, okay, well, I'll stay out of danger zone and not talk about who's. Uh, <laughs> what I, my great love is um, my house at Sorrento. Yes. Uh, my holiday house, which I've had for 30 years. And uh, to be truthful, by extension, it's the Sorrento pub. Oh, yeah. Now, I don't mean to paint myself as a... Uh, as an alcoholic, which I'm probably nearly qualified, but, <laughs> but I love being down there on a Saturday, um, watching the footy, going to the pub uh, for about an hour and a half, watch the mm. Twilight game on the TVs in the bar, uh, and then home and watch the footy at night. But it's, it's sort of like, it's a ritual, you know, it just... Great setup. Oh, I'd be quite happy with that oh, ritual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah no, yes. no, and I do, it, it is that. And even, it doesn't matter what the weather's like or what the events of the day have been, at 5.30 on a Saturday night, uh, myself and two or three mates head down there and just uh, smash, <laughs> smash a few down. <laughs> a few vinos uh, or a few beers? No, beers. Yeah. No, you've got yeah. beers in the Sereno yeah. pub, mate. Well, I, you can come you home know, and have a vino. Might have been a, a red wine <laughs> drinker, I don't know. No, I am, uh, but I go home. The, the red wine is when I get home, Clint. Very nice. Uh, Mike, just, I suppose, on the, on the current list and where we're at, how do you see the Melbourne Footy Club placed at the moment and perhaps the future in the next one to two years? No, I'm optimistic. I, I, I think it's a good list. I think uh, the, the one caveat I have on that is that uh, I think Jack Viney is mm. almost the most important player mm. on the list and he's not playing and uh, 
if you're realistic about where he's at at the moment, it would look like it's at least six weeks. But if, with me, I'd play if Jack's fit. Even on grand final day, and he hasn't played for ten weeks. I'm playing him. Yeah, because I think he's so important to the vibe of that team. Do we make finals this season? Well, yeah, I had a look Mike, at the draw. I mean, that's a tough draw, one. The draw's not good, is mm. it? I think we're going to not for the first time. We're going to rue a couple of mm. games mm. that got Slipped away from us that, uh, that shouldn't have. But I suppose the thing is, if we're going to have any impact in finals, we've got to beat teams that play in finals, and that's that's who we face in the next six weeks. And that is the assignment ahead. Yeah, and so it's no. I mean, if we get there and just to get turfed out because we're not good enough to play the good teams. Well, it's a bit self-defeating, isn't it? It is. Mike Sheen, it's been sensational. You're going to stand by because uh, we're about to welcome our next guest. Uh, it is young Charlie Spargo. Now, I believe you've got a few questions of your own for Charlie. So, well, uh, I don't think a story I, for him. Well, I don't think too many uh, of the current Melbourne players have been open mic'd yet. So this is a real... No, I don't do current players. I know, I know. That's what, yeah. So this is a real, uh, this is a real privilege for, is it a treat? for Charlie. It's a treat. For Charlie or for me? Well, for both. <laughs> uh, Charlie Spargo to join us after this very short break on Inside Melbourne with thanks to Zurich. Thanks to our co-major partner and podcast sponsor, Zurich. For over 100 years, they've been ensuring the people and things you truly love. And just like you, they truly love footy and truly love Melbourne. Welcome back to Inside Melbourne. We're here thanks to Zurich. We've got Clint Stanaway with us as our co-host. We've got a legend of the Australian football media in Mike Sheehan, who we've already had a long chat to, and we've got one of the young guns of the club with us today, Charlie Spargo. Welcome. Thanks for having me, guys. How's the season been for you, your debut season? It's been so exciting to see your development so far. Yeah, it's been awesome. It's probably uh, been a bit overwhelming. It's all happened really quick. I wasn't I wasn't expecting to come in when I did. Probably at the start of the year, I wasn't expecting to play in round six. And then even when I did get the call up to play, I really wasn't expecting to come in that week either. So it's been a bit of a pleasant surprise. But um, yeah, I thought I've played some consistent footy uh, for the last 10 or so weeks. Uh, I got dropped for a couple of weeks, but I uh, got my way back in and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been good. I've really enjoyed um, playing, especially in the forward line. I think we function really well. As you can see, a lot of people, different people can come in and contribute right away. So yeah, I think... Uh, it's good down there. I'm looking forward to uh, what what holds in the second half of the season. Charlie, probably weren't expecting uh, to be interviewed by Mike Sheen either. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, um, uh, you know the family. I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the family's steeped in tradition at another place, isn't it? Yeah, that's uh, right. The Witten Oval. Yeah. yeah. And actually... Um, Look, uh, this will date me, but I, 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 if anyone has a look at me, they'll know I'm old. <laughs> uh, your grandfather, Just Bobby, wise, Mike. Yep. Uh, played in the 61 grand final. And you probably won't know this, but on grand final day in 61, Bob Spargo, your grandfather, and Bernie Lee, the fullback in that team, carried me to my seat here at the MCG in the northern stand because I'd had a broken leg from a <laughs> footy accident <laughs> and then went down and, and um, got changed and went out and played for the doggies. So imagine how big... It was worth having the broken leg, actually, (laughs) because (laughs) the two blokes playing for the doggies had both put their gear in the room, came back and carried me up the stairs to uh, to my seat. So I've got very, very fond memories of uh, of your grandfather. Yeah, there you go. That doesn't really sound like something Bobby would do. He's pretty... <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> when, you, you're talking about the, your link with the Bulldogs, when you were... You were clearly going to be drafted because the raps on you were so big. Did you want to go to the Bulldogs or did you not care? Um, well... Um, I didn't actually interview with the Bulldogs. I interviewed with probably 16 of the 18 clubs and the Bulldogs weren't one. I think they've already got their fair share of small people. So (laughs) in terms of list needs, they probably didn't. Were you disappointed? Uh, No, not really. I was, well, Dad played for North, so I was more of a North supporter growing up. Um, My uncles, a a couple of my uncles, um, and then Ricky, who's Bobby's brother, uh, they they were all pretty mad Bulldogs. But um, yeah, I was North, so I was more so looking at Trying to get Who was your favourite player at North? Can't be your dad. Nah, Burma. Burma? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. There's a bit of you, a bit of you uh, in Burma. There's uh, a bit of Burma in you. A couple of people have said that. I don't know. He's probably a bit quicker than me. Yeah, he, <laughs> he may be, but I mean, that sort of small yeah, yeah. forward. Yeah, no, yeah. No, I definitely try and emulate his game, take little things from him. Yeah. yeah. What's the biggest surprise about your time at AFL level? Uh, is it the pace or is it the intensity? I think it's, yeah, it's making decisions quickly. It's not so much. 
obviously you've got to be a good athlete and, and you have good skills and stuff like that. But I feel like the better players are the ones who can think quicker. And that's something I had to adjust to early on. I wasn't making decisions quick enough because that's the one thing that can get you out the back and get an open goal or something like that. I think a lot of the older players like Jordan Lewis, um, they just, they're always thinking, they're always concentrating, they're always thinking what's next. So that's something I've tried to... He's got 15 years on you, remember? Yeah, I know, but Bit of experience. the way his mind works is just... Yeah, it's pretty pretty unbelievable. Uh, sorry, go, go for Katie. Oh, just Charlie, with the in terms of the family history, uh, we've already mentioned your uh, granddad, but your great-granddad as well also yeah. played at the highest level. How much do you know about those older generations and the footy that they played? Um, I know a lot about Bobby, my grandpa. Um, Dad's, Dad told me he won a... Correct me if I'm, I'm not sure what it's called. Sandover medal. He played in the um, in yes, WA, West yep. Australia. Oh, we played in the the state of origin game against Victoria and got best on ground in one of those games or something like he that. He also played in Perth, didn't he? Yeah, he. Yeah. he oh, geez, I don't want to say it because I'll probably get it wrong. I think it was East Perth that he coached at for a bit, <laughs> East or West Perth. I can't remember. <laughs> that that just proves how much I know about. It. Um, <laughs> and then yeah, the chief, which was Bobby's dad. Um, dad's told me a fair bit. I know. They were pretty involved in athletics and running in, in stall right. gifts and stuff like that. So, yeah, I don't know Where'd a whole lot go? about you. Where the pace go? It stopped at Dad. And <laughs> he was, from what I hear, he's pretty slow. But Ricky, Ricky was very Ricky quick. was fast, yeah. yeah. I think it just, yeah, a bit of a trough when, when Dad came. But I think I've got a little a bit more pace than Dad at least. <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of the uh, modern day Spargo, um, you wear the number nine. Um, mm. David Neitz uh, has spent a lot of time around the club recently. Have you had a chat to Nita? Yeah, I have. I saw, um, we actually read my name out on draft night. So he went up to Sydney and, and read out pick number 29. And then I got the choice between number nine or number 31, which is wow. obviously Ron Bruce. Well, and then my dad, <laughs> my dad wore that at um, North as well. So I was, was tossing it up, but I, know I went for a lower number. Well, the, yeah. you, you've uh, I've done due honour to number nine, yeah. and, and I love the bloke in number 31. I've been overheard yeah. to say in uh, my excitement watching Melbourne that he'd be the best 31 since Ron Barassi. Yes, yes. He's a good player, yeah. Fritter and I, we get along pretty well. We've been spending a fair bit of time together. Were you worried about the weight of wearing a number 31? A number nine. No, but say but when, you had, the when you had the nah, choice. Nah, I wasn't. Um, no. I, well, I guess there's a lot of weight as well with, with number the nine. nine. Where, yeah, there is. With Neats. Um, but I don't know. Especially after talking to Nita, he sort of said, make the number your own. He's a really good bloke. He said, don't put any pressure on yourself. So I've sort of, after his words, I've forgotten about it and just mm -hmm. worried about playing footy. It's just, it's just a number, really. Um, Charlie, who do you hang out with most at the club? Yeah, so probably Fritar is a fair bit, so a there's fair a bit, bit of, to do with him. So there's a bit of uh, man love between both of you? I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it man love, but we're, we're pretty <laughs> at each other a fair bit. There's a lot of banter. You can do that. I hear, you, hey, so okay. I hear you hang out a lot. We do hang out yeah. a lot, but we're mostly hanging a bit of shit on each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, my fav can I ask you about my favourite who's not playing at the moment? Not his, he's not, no, I shouldn't say my favourite. One of my favourites, Jaden Hunt. Yeah. Now, I continually say that he's in the, he's in the best <laughs> Melbourne 22. Yeah. Do you agree with me? Um... When he's certainly when he's up and running, he's he's definitely got the talent to be in the in the twenty two. But you know he's injured at the moment, so I think it's his syndesmosis. So yeah, he's he's coming back from that. But yeah, he's very exciting. And bit of when a, he's fit, bit of a strange cat as well, isn't he? I like it though. I think it's good. I like I like different people. It's good to hang out with him. You don't get your usual conversation talking to him, but it's interesting. There was so actually I, I get along with him there was well. actually a question from the outer, which was intended for Mike, but I'm going to ask it. Of you because Jaden will, you know, his answer will be very predictable. That is Nippies or Big M because he's a big Nippies fan, is he not? Nippies he's chocolate milk. Well, I think he's got a sponsor. Chocolate with milk. Nippies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sorry, Charlie. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, we ask the big questions yeah. on Inside Melbourne. Yeah. I actually have never heard the word Nippies before. Haven't you? It's good. Nappies it's good is milk. the closest I got to good milk. <laughs> yeah. I'd have to go Nippies over Big M. <laughs> Charlie, yeah. I think your first game, I think it was Gary Lyon um, that said basically, you look like a choir boy, but don't play like one. Yeah. What do you like off field? What do I like off field? Choi um, choir boy? Yeah, I'm pretty reserved, I think. Yeah, I've got a bit of white line fever. There's no doubt about that. Once I, once I start playing footy, I, I get very angry. And you can, if you speak to anyone at Melbourne, they probably think I have a little man syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn at Melbourne Grammar? Don't give me the... <laughs> The academic stuff. Yeah. What, what was the greatest lesson that came out of your time at Melbourne Grammar? Probably just being away from family. I, I became a lot more independent. Um, so, yeah, left 
my last year of school in Albury was in year nine. So I was at Melbourne Grammar from years 10 to 12 and I became a lot more independent sort of, I wasn't um, a trouble kid or anything back in Albury, but I was sort of pulled my head in and got a lot, a lot more organised. And I think going to boarding school as such a, uh, a high quality boarding school like Melbourne Grammar was, it prepared me well to step into an AFL environment given uh, I grew up a lot uh, yeah, and became a lot more independent, a lot more organised. There weren't too many uh, boys with roots in Footscray that uh, ended up at Melbourne Grammar. What, Does that make sense? Oh, I think so. Oh, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'm mean. just saying there, w there wouldn't have been many kids who grew up in Footscray oh, no, or not, had links to Footscray. Yeah, especially not my grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> he went to Footscray Tech. Yeah. Touche. Yeah. Um, Charlie, the next assignment is a trip down the, uh, down the highway, down yep. the Geelong Road to tackle the cats. That's a big one. Yeah, uh, for the club, no yeah. doubt. No, no, no doubt. Um, I haven't played Saturday night, Saturday night footy yet, so I'm I'm looking forward to that. It's a um, great really, baptism of fire, isn't it? Yeah, especially in a hostile. You heard some blokes called Dangerfield Selwood Ablett, have you? Yeah, I've, I've definitely <laughs> heard about that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm keen to play against them. I've, they'll probably be the they'll probably be the biggest. Uh, besides Queen's birthday, probably one of the bigger games mm. I've played in so far this year. But yeah, I, I'm confident that if we if we play play our way and play well, we're, we're every chance of, of winning down there. Charlie, the, the external narrative has been Melbourne needs to get a scalp, but it seems from the club, particularly in the last week, that there is a genuine hunger to go down to Geelong and to come away with a win. And yeah, that's right. As Mike said before when he was listening to, to Louis talk on, on AFL 360, there's a, there's a confidence within the group that mm. it's not... We don't not come to play in big games, but we're, we're confident that on, on our night we're just as good as anyone else. Are in the competition, so I don't see any reason why we can't go down on Saturday. Particularly having you know made a few uh, changes just in terms of our mindset and stuff like that in the last few weeks, especially after a couple of losses on the trot like that. So yeah, what, I think. What are those changes? What's what's been done behind the scenes? Just just a more emphasis on defence. That's that's all we need it needed to do. And just yeah, that once once we defend, we we showed it in that six week stretch. Because after I, I played my first game, we won six in a row and. Our defence was, was mm. good. And then once once we defend well, that's what kickstarts our offence. So. But from the outside looking in, Charlie, you say the more emphasis on defence. What turned the game at the weekend was the centre square dominance. That's right. That, well, that always helps when Maxie's tapping it down. <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was crazy looking at it. Like, I was standing there as a, like, almost as, as a bystander in the forward line just watching Max to Gus, Gus to Clary. Amazing. Clary and so it's, yeah, we're, we're very lucky we've got such a talented on-ball brigade like that. Mike, one to you. Uh, can the Demons do it Saturday night? I, I think they can. Yeah. I, I, not having been in the seat mm. of blokes like Charlie and the, occupying that seat, there's clearly a negative attitude about going to places like Geelong mm. and Footy Park in Adelaide and, and the new place in Perth. But I reckon if they go down there with the attitude that we're as good as this mob and we, ha we just happen to be playing at Geelong, mm. there's got to be a venue for it. Uh, so I like the fact that Louis and Charlie now both said that there's not a hope, there's a sort of a belief. Yeah, definitely. Great stuff. Uh, Charlie, thanks so much for joining us on Inside Melbourne. It's been a pleasure. Speaking of pleasures, it's been a pleasure and an honour to have you, Mike Sheen, on board thanks. as a guest and as a co-host, grilling the young man, <laughs> Charlie Spargo. I, always re I, I thought when I'm halfway through my third question, I'm not actually here for that, but <laughs> that's just my natural inclination. <laughs> Good stuff. Uh, Katie, thanks also uh, for your help today. It's been sensational. That's another episode of Inside Melbourne. Keep those questions coming uh, for our guests next week. Uh, thanks to Zurich Inside Melbourne for another week.